Hola, hi, this is Al, your statistics instructor. Let's get to work. In this video, we will talk about residuals, different kinds of residuals, and how we can find them using R. Let's begin. So, I want you to consider the following data set. Let me point out that you have seen it before. It's an old data set. X represents the uh, number of hours a student uh, spends studying for a final exam and Y represents their final exam score. Okay? Okay. So, before we talk about the different kinds of residuals, let me remind you something that we have done up to this point. Remember that in another video uh, we found the uh, estimates of uh, the uh, coefficients for the full model, meaning, uh, well, the model with all the observations included, and then we saw what happened uh, when uh, each of these observations were removed. Okay, so in particular, what we saw was that uh, removing the fifth observation made a difference. Okay, something that we also did was finding uh, the leverages. Right, we uh, talked about leverages, and what we said is that they could be useful to identify influential observations. Okay, so it turns out that we're going to need uh, the leverages here to talk about uh, residuals, so we might as well find them. Okay, now let me uh, show you the model that we're going to be considering. Okay, we are going to be using the uh, centered model, right? So we are going to compute the uh, matrix H accordingly, right? With respect to uh, this uh, centered model, okay? So let me uh, remind you of what is the expression that we need to find H right the hat matrix okay and remember that the leverages are the diagonal elements of the matrix H okay now since we are and by the way that matrix X represents what we call uh, the design matrix so since we are considering a centered model the design matrix X looks like this, okay? And this will be the first observation minus, well, the first uh, value for the predictor fi uh, variable minus its mean, and so on, right? We do that for all five observations, okay? So this guy here, this vector of ones is going to be the first column of our matrix X and these guys here minus 2, 0, 1, 3 and minus 2 will be uh, the elements of the second column of our uh, design matrix X okay and uh, just uh, you know doing matrix multiplications we will be able to get our design uh, I'm sorry our hat matrix H you know okay so let's do that. So here we have the R code that we would need. So let me copy and paste and make sure that it works. We launch R. And here we go. Uh, let me do 
this. Okay, that's so much better. So the first column of our design matrix is just a vector of ones. Okay. The other one has those differences. Okay. Now, uh, maybe we have used this before when we talked about when we first introduced the matrix H, but just in case, let me remind you that this built-in function uh, is telling R to paste these two elements column-wise, right? C bind. Now, since uh, we want to find H, the hat matrix, uh, and we're going in to find it uh, from the design matrix, we have to carry out uh, matrix multiplications. Let's make sure that R knows that uh, X is a matrix. Okay. So we have this guy, and by the way, let me show you what X looks like. Okay, so it is what we want, right? Okay. Anyway, we want to make sure that R will think of X as a matrix. Okay, five rows, two columns, but now R knows that it's a matrix. Then we just find the first element uh, that we will need to find H, right? Transpose of X times X. Right? Remember that. And we have here the expression for H. So it's this guy, X transpose X inverse, right? Okay. So the next step will be just, you know, doing that whole multiplication first, uh, finding the inverse here. And uh, this is going to be easy, even if we had to do it by hand. Uh, the uh, inverse would be 1 over 5 and 1 over 18, right? And then we just multiply that, the inverse of x transpose x by x. Well, we pre-multiply and then post-multiply by X transpose. Okay? So... We already have the code here. Okay? And again, to find the inverse, you use that built-in function solve. Right? And then we are pre-multiplying by X and post-multiplying by the transpose of X. Okay? So that would be H. Now, if we type H, we get the hat matrix, right? But then on that line, what we're doing is we're just rounding uh, that matrix H to four decimal places with that built-in function round, and that four uh, tells R how many decimal places we want. So now if we type the name of uh, the object we just created, H, it's going to look like this. Okay, so now we get to see it, uh, you know, entirely. So we have a 5 by 5 matrix, as we should, because we have 5 observations. Okay, so what I want you to remember is that what we said is that, in general, right, the sum of the uh, diagonal elements of uh, H, which are the uh, leverages, right, is going to be equal to uh, the number of parameters in your model. In this case, we have uh, two parameters, right? The uh, intercept and the slope. So, if we compute the diagonal H, so we're extracting 
this, right? The elements located at the diagonal. And then if we compute the sum of those diagonal elements according to the theory, we should have the number of parameters in our model, too. That's the case. And uh, when we discussed leverages, what we said is that the average level, would, uh, the average uh, leverage would be uh, 2 divided by the number of observations, right? And to uh, uh, that a rule to identify uh, influential observations according to this criterion of the leverage would be if you have a kind of big sample size, more than 30 observations, uh, the observations that are beyond two times the average leverage would be considered an influential observation or it's candidate for uh, an influential observation and if you have a small sample size meaning less than or equal to 30 uh, then three times that so according to that criterion and if we type H again so none of these guys according to that criterion uh, seems to be uh, an influential observation but something else that we said and then what I need is to go back to the uh, original data I think it's uh, slide 4 something that we also discussed was uh, what happens when you compute the uh, when you estimate the coefficients of your model right uh, and you remove one of those observations. So let me uh, compute the uh, linear regression and find, uh, well, let me find the least squares regression line and then find the estimators, the estimates for the uh, uh, y intercept and for the slope and then do the same removing the fifth observation. Okay, so y is just. Uh, three, four, five, six, and seven, okay? And uh, now, remember that the model that we are considering is the centered model, right? So if you remember what we did here is the second column is our predictor, right? So let me call this guy model with all the observations. Okay? So linear model y and then my predictor will be call 2. Second column. Okay? So we know that if we need the coefficients of a linear model, all we need is that built-in function coef and that's it. Right? And we know right that uh, when we estimate these coefficients right the uh, estimate of the uh, y-intercept must be y bar so let's check that we have the right one because if we were considering the classical regression model it would be different right so just to check that uh, we have the right one yeah so this guy here, 0.166, would be the estimator, uh, well, the estimate, because we have the actual number, the estimate for the uh, slope parameter, right? Okay, but now, that's with all the observations, but how about we remove the fifth observation? Let me call this guy mod 5 and what we understand by that is that we're removing the fifth observation and then we compute the uh, coefficient, right? Uh, coefficients, both of them. So it makes a difference, right? But is it significantly different? So what we're going to do is something that we did before but just uh, kind of a reminder so if you do that if you carry out a hypothesis test for the model that includes all the observations 
the uh, slope parameter is not significantly different from zero. On the other hand, if you do it for the one where you removed the fifth observation, it is, right? So it makes a difference. So what I want you to remember here is that according to one criterion uh, leverage, right, uh, the fifth observation is not influential. But then when you compute uh, the, uh, when you estimate the uh, coefficients of your linear model, it seems that the fifth observation uh, is influential, right? So is, is there any other way of uh, measuring influence? So that's why we're going to be talking about residuals. That's why we're going to be talking actually about uh, different kinds of residuals. So let's see. Uh, now, so we have that matrix H and at some point we said and we spent uh, uh, well a little bit of time uh, talking again about properties of uh, H and I minus H and uh, also we derived the expected value of the residuals and the variance of the residuals and all that will be very useful here in this discussion that we're going to have for this particular example okay so let me remind you that one way of finding the uh, predicted uh, values from our model would be uh, just doing this multiplication, this matrix multiplication, H times Y, okay? So uh, let's see, we already have H, right? And we already have uh, Y, okay? And let me see, I think I already have the R code here to make it faster. So this is our column vector of Y's and this is where we have Y hat, which is just again a matrix multiplication between H and Y. Okay, so let me copy paste those two, make sure that uh, that works. So we have Y hat is that right okay now as you already know residuals are defined as our observations minus our predictions okay so let me use e okay as opposed to epsilon because e these guys are the uh, estimates of the residuals uh, i'm sorry of the errors so e represents our residual and by residual what we mean is an estimate of the epsilon of the error term that uh, random fluctuation that we don't get to see okay so let's see if we get this okay so it seems to be working fine we get the same result okay so uh, that would be one way but remember that uh, we already uh, found the, uh, well, we already fitted the model, right? Remember, I think we called that guy mod.all here. Uh, there we are, right? So that would be another way, or there's another way we already know uh, of finding uh, the residuals for the uh, model right so if we type names right we see all the objects inside that linear model residuals would be what we want so another way of finding those residuals would be this right and rest should be fine so can you see these should be the same as e with that matrix multiplication. So as you can see, they match, right? Okay. Now, uh, another way, it, just using matrix multiplication. And that's why we discussed that matrix I minus H, because it turns out 
that well, uh, this, this vector E could be obtained by this, I minus H times, you know, Y, the vector of observations. And uh, in this case, we are going to be able, using R, to create a diagonal matrix okay, of ones with this built-in function, diag5. Okay, let me show you, and then we're going to uh, compute that way the uh, residuals. So, I, C, is an identity matrix of dimensions 5 by 5. Okay, so if we do this multiplication, I minus H times uh, Y, well, matrix multiplication, there. So that's another way, okay? Okay. So on the next slide, what we have is just a reminder that here we have the original predictor, here we have the uh, response variable, and in this case we're just using the classical regression model, okay? And we're finding the residuals, and we get the same result, okay? So residuals will not be affected by the kind of model that you're using. You could use the classical regression model or the centered regression model and uh, the residuals will, will be the same. By the way, here I'm giving you an alternative way of finding the residuals. Once you have the model, you could type residuals and then the name of the model inside brackets and then you get the residuals. Or it could be just like the way we just did it, uh, mod 1 dollar sign and then res or residuals and that will give you the residuals of the model as well, right? Okay, so uh, this would be again an alternative of finding those residuals similar to what we did, right? With that uh, centered model, okay? Okay, so uh, what I want you to see is that the fifth observation is the one with the uh, greatest uh, residual, okay? But those residuals, the ordinary residuals, are given in raw units. So it seems to be big, but the question is, is it big enough to be considered unusual, right? To be considered an outlier? We're going to call these guys with uh, an unusual difference between uh, what we saw, what we observed, and what we predicted, okay? So, uh, since it's difficult to assess in terms of raw units if a residual is big enough from a statistical perspective that's why uh, people came up with a different uh, version of residuals so the uh, other flavor of residuals that we're going to be talking about here is this standardized residuals so what we're doing here is remember that the epsilons are assumed to be random fluctuations with mean zero and variance sigma square. So if we divide by the standard deviation, we are standardizing those residuals. They should behave kind of like a normal zero one, right? Okay, but we don't get to see sigma square, the, v the variance. Right? And we don't get to see the standard deviation, which is the square root of that variance. But we know that we can estimate sigma square by using the mean square error, which is SSE divided by n minus 2 in the case of a simple linear regression model. Okay? So that's how we're going to standardize these uh, residuals. Okay? 
So on the next slide, I prepared some uh, R code for you. So let's just uh, read it and then we're going to copy paste it to make sure that it works. So here, no problem, you have done this before. We enter the uh, uh, observations, right? Uh, we enter the response variable, the predictor variable. Uh, here we fit the model, right? Here we know that this is a way of finding the residuals for that model, we just uh, fit it. And then, as we said, the mean square error is just SSE, meaning the sum of squares for the error, right? Divided by n minus 2, meaning the degrees of freedom for that quantity. So R will have, uh, will keep track of those uh, uh, degrees of freedom, right? And then this by std.e, what we mean is the standardized version of the uh, residuals. So we just divide the error by you know, the square root of uh, the mean square error, our estimator for the variance. Okay, so let's see, it should work fine. Okay, so we get what we have here, right? And uh, so, for instance, uh, this guy here, the fifth observation, seems to be 1.3 standard deviations to the right of the center of the distribution, right? So, using the empirical rule, you know that if we have a normal 0, 1 between negative 2 and 2, uh, you should have roughly 95% of the observations. So, this guy doesn't seem to be that big if we compare it, you know, to a normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1, right? Okay, but now let me show you something. Remember that we spent a uh, you know, a considerable amount of time deriving the uh, expected value of the residuals and the variance of the residuals, right? Well, and this is why uh, the theoretical errors, right? They are independent and uh, they have the same variance sigma square, right? Well, but it turns out that the residuals are not independent, meaning the quantities that we use to estimate the uh, epsilons, the E's, EI's, right, are not independent, right? We showed that the expected value, yeah, it's zero. But the variance is not sigma square, is this, right? And where HI is the diagonal element of the H matrix, of the hat matrix. So I minus HI happens to be the diagonal element of the identity minus H matrix, okay? Well, so anyway, I just wanted you to see this because that's why we spend time finding these, okay? So, the point is, uh, these results will allow us to standardize the residuals in a different way, in a more appropriate way, if you will. So, the next flavor of residuals that we're going to talk about here is this, studentized residuals. So note that the difference between the ones that we had before, right, the standardized uh, residuals and the studentized residuals, the difference between them is just the denominator. We are dividing by a different quantity, right? And note 
that the denominator here, the mean square error, is an estimator for sigma squared, right? And this guy here is just, as we said, the diagonal element of the identity minus h matrix, i minus h, right? So that denominator there is just the square root of this, of the theoretical variance for epsilon i. Make sense? Okay, so now on the next slide I prepared some R code for you, right? Uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be modifying the denominator, right? Using those results that we obtained, right? Before that we showed before. Uh, first, uh, we obtained this already, right? But let me show you what happens with uh, that matrix. Well, with that uh, built-in command, LM influence, okay? So, uh, we define H as this, right? So by using that built-in function LM influence of that model and then dollar sign hat, let me show you what the uh, H uh, object contains, right? It has those five numbers. Now, let me remind you what the diagonal elements of H look like. Guess what, right? H, we computed this, uh, you know, by hand or step by step using matrix multiplication, right? But this, it turns out that this guy, LM influence, and then, uh, then using dollar sign hat, that is going to give you the leverages automatically. No need to do that matrix multiplication, okay? Okay, now, uh, this is just the modified version of the uh, denominator, right? And what we're doing here is just rounding those studentized residuals to four decimal places. Okay, let's do that and we get this, okay? So 1.72, so still, using the empirical rule, right, this guy doesn't seem to be that big, that unusual for a normal zero, one. So now, let me show you another version, another flavor of residuals, okay? So, there's something called the deleted studentized uh, residuals. So, how that works? Well, in that case, we're going to modify the studentized uh, residuals by doing this, by computing the mean square error, but deleting the ith observation. See how that changes. Okay? So, on the next slide, I have some R code ready for you here. So, what I did here is I computed the uh, first deleted studentized residual, right? Kind of a step-by-step. -step. We have used this, right? This bracket minus one. So, what we're doing here in this particular example is just removing the first observation, okay? We're removing the value for the response, we're removing the value for the predictor. So we're seeing what happens uh, with this. We're uh, obtaining the first deleted uh, studentized residual step by step, okay? So let me just copy-paste and make sure that everything works, 
Okay, so again, the difference between the regular studentized residuals and these guys is that we are removing one observation at a time and see how uh, that changes things. Okay. Okay, so it seems to be working good. Now, we don't have to do it in this case. We have a very small data set, only five observations, but uh, we would like to be able to do this quickly for a bigger data set. Well, there's a quick way of doing this. There's a built-in function, right? RS student, right? And then you fit the linear model that you're interested in first, and then just using this built-in function, you're going to be able to get the uh, deleted studentized residuals. Okay, let's copy paste to make sure that it works. Great. Now, from that, right, using that particular flavor of residuals, we can clearly see that this guy, this guy is big. Right? It's really big. Okay, so uh, just a final note about this. I mean, if we, if we compare that with, uh, you know, uh, normal zero one, yeah, you can see that it's, uh, it's really big. It's way to the right of two, right? Or way to the right of three, even, right? But uh, if uh, you want to assess the statistical significance of a deleted studentized residual, usually you compare that not to a normal zero one. You compare it uh, to a t distribution with n minus p plus one, uh, degrees of freedom, where p plus 1 would be the uh, number of parameters in your model, including the intercept. So p plus 1, in our case, is 2. Okay? So, uh, because uh, p would be the number of uh, predictors, and we only have one predictor, right? The, and the 1 would be uh, the one taking into account the y-intercept. Okay, so p represents the number of predictors that you have here, and in this case we only have one predictor, the number of hours uh, a student spends studying before the final exam. Okay, anyway, so in our case n minus p plus 1 would be 5 minus 2, 3, right? So uh, you would compare uh, this guy against a quantile from a t-distribution with that many degrees of freedom. So, we know that uh, t-distributions look very similar to normal distributions if you have a large number of degrees of freedom, right? So, for instance, if degrees of freedom is 1000, Oh, that looks really close to, you know, the critical values from a normal zero one, right? Using the empirical rule, between negative two and two, you should have roughly 95% of your observations, right? So, uh, exactly, if you use a table or, or a computer, is not two standard deviations, but uh, 1.96 standard deviations to the left or to the right, okay? Now, what we said is, what we're going to have is n minus p plus 1. n, the number of observations, 5 minus 2, which is p plus 1 in this case, the number of parameters in your model, so that's 3 degrees of freedom. So anyway, the critical value here would be 3.18, and this guy is way to the right. So clearly using this flavor of residuals, uh, the fifth observation seems to be unusual, influential. Okay? Okay, so let's summarize what we did here. 
uh, what we did here in this video was talking a bit more about residuals. We talked about different kinds of residuals, right? And we uh, saw how we can obtain each of those uh, different kinds of residuals using R. Okay? And we also saw that uh, it's a good idea to assess uh, whether or not a particular observation is influential using different uh, approaches, not just uh, leverages, but uh, for instance, in this case, uh, taking a closer look at residuals and uh, we also saw that uh, depending on the kind of uh, residuals that you're using you're going to uh, be identifying observations as influential or not depending on that, right? The kind of uh, residuals that you are considering for your uh, residual analysis, okay? Well, uh, thank you so much for watching. Please take care and keep working hard. See you next time. Bye.